I don't know if you appreciate the importance of hearing this story uh, published in a book uh, that is a novel that uh, is by the author of a best-selling uh, novel uh, and published by an uh, establishment press. This is exactly the story that has been denied for over 60 years by, by Israeli propaganda, which is really at the crux of the whole problem of, of the Palestine-Israel conflict. Uh, the crux being what happened in 1948 and the recognition of what happened in 1948 and the attempt to, to come to terms with it by, by, by the world and by the Israeli people. Uh, when I met, as you heard from Gavin uh, Marina in, uh, at the Orwell Trust, uh, uh, she told me that she was writing a novel that had a Palestinian component and that she wanted to come and visit. And I was very worried for her. I thought I've heard of so many people who wanted to write with a Palestinian um, dimension and how problematic that, that is. Problematic because many people do not get it right because uh, it's, it's complicated. Uh, problematic because if they get it right and, and they publish it, they get uh, a lot of lack and a lot of problems. Now I hope this doesn't happen to Marina that she gets problems, but so far it seems to be good. In any case, Marina did come and uh, uh, we did have this wonderful walk and in a short period of time, I was really impressed at how uh, capable she was of going around on her own, finding out, uh, getting in touch with the place, with the people, feeling it, empathizing with it. And then finally, uh, there was the last very important bit, which was to read the book, which I did just last week. Uh, I had read some parts, and so I, I wasn't very uncomfortable. Very worried, but when I read the book, I was extremely happy. I thought, here is Marina, able to grasp uh, the, the the issue, uh, able to put it in her style, which is entertaining and, and natural and funny, uh, and at the same time able to uh, in, in, to to create and and make the reader realize the complexity of it, uh, rather than glossing it over. So I really congratulate you for, for this great achievement. And I think it is a great achievement. I will read you a very different uh, account of a, the similar story of Lidda uh, from uh, an earlier um, memoir of mine, uh, Strangers in the House, which, which uh, was recently republished as a paperback. And it uh, is uh, of uh, account my father, my parents had been in Jaffa, and, and they had been forced out. They came to their house in Amalda, this was before I was born. And, uh, and while, uh, uh, while in Amalda, having left in, in July, in, in April, uh, they uh, were hearing news about Lid. Now Lid, uh, which is Lid in English, Lud in Hebrew, uh, Lid in Arabic, uh, is uh, one of the last towns to have been uh, for, uh, where the people were forced out. So they, they uh, everyone else, more or less, in the big cities, in Zatim, in Haifa, in Jaffa, they left by April, by May, certainly, everybody had been forced out. Not everybody, but mostly everybody. Uh, the little people uh, were managed to stay. And it was only in July that they were forced out. And they were forced out, as you heard, uh, at gunpoint. Uh, so my, my father was already in, in Ramallah when uh, this... Uh, on May 14, three weeks after my parents left Jaffa, the establishment of the Israeli state was declared over an area of land larger than that reserved for the Jews by the UN. Uh, by the UN, Jaffa was included. And the inclusion of Jaffa is, is significant because my father left Jaffa thinking that if the worst happened, which is the uh, uh, partition, then the Persian state, that according to the partition, would include Jaffa, and so he would be able to return. So he wasn't very worried. Uh, but of course, it didn't turn out like that at all. My father could not return. But if my father uh, blamed himself for having left, these feelings receded with the events of the evening 
of July 17. It was a windless, warm evening, I later heard my father relate to friends. We were able to sit out on the porch late into the night. This is in Ramallah. It was already 11 when we finally turned in. Two hours later, I was awakened by knocking on the door. When I opened the door, I found my close friend, Dr. Chara standing there, looking very haggard and exhausted. He had refused to leave Jaffa with us and instead had moved to Lidda to continue serving patients. I was shocked to see him standing there so late at night. I will never forget how he looked. He was so changed that he was like a stranger to me. His face seemed longer than usual with two lines down the middle of each cheek. He was pale and withdrawn. His lips were black and thin and his mouth was parched. But what stood out most of all was the look in his brown eyes. The dark circles around them were common enough after several sleepless nights, but Dr. Bshara's pupils had an inward gaze. His eyes were not waiting, wilting for lack of sleep. Opaque, they held a deeply pained, bewildered expression of dread and emptiness, a vulnerable emptiness, usually filled with warmth and humanity. They had a look of revulsion. He was unable to communicate the horror he had witnessed. Much as I wanted to know what had happened, I asked no questions. I gently held the doctor to the living room couch and helped the doctor to the living room couch. The yet untold horrors he had experienced perturbed me. When we got up the next morning, we found that thousands of refugees who had walked all the way from Lidda and Ramle were pouring into Ramallah, each the story of the misery and hardship they encountered in the course of the first forced march from the coastal cities to the hill town of Ramallah. And you've heard one of these stories.